Hey, it's good to be with you guys. Thank you so much for having us. It's a little embarrassing to, to say that I've lived in, I'm originally from the metro Detroit area and uh, moved, uh, met my wife in college, um, 1976, man, we're old, in a little town of Owasso, which is between Flint and Lansing. And then uh, my wife is from Holland. And uh, after my sophomore year of college, I transferred to Hope College. And you talk about a culture shock from, from, so I was raised in a big Irish Catholic family, union, you know, Democrats, all, and I end up in Holland, Michigan. I mean, it, it was like, holy, what just happened? And by the way, to my, my Sparty friend here, so I was 11 years, this has nothing to do with anything I'm going to talk about, but uh, when I was 11 years old, this was before cable, this is back if you're old enough, there were like three TV stations, CBS, NBC, ABC, that was it. And uh, it was in November of 1969 that I watched my first college football game ever. I should be a huge Notre Dame fan because my dad was and Irish Catholics and all that. But I turned on a TV and it was Michigan versus Ohio State. And it was Bo Schembechler's rookie year. And I, I just got caught up in the drama because Ohio State had won the national championship in 1968. So here comes Bo Schembechler, rookie coach, first year. And they, they upset Ohio State. And I got caught up in the drama. And to this day, that's why I'm a Michigan fanatic. So go blue. I do root for Michigan State. God forgives you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. It's not football that unites us, is it? No. So um, what I'd like to do this morning is I'd really like to speak to um, the young guys and in, in the, the, the young folk here. And I'm going to let everybody like 20 and older listen in. <laughs> All right? And I promise you guys I'm not going to do anything weird. I'm not going to make you do anything weird. But, but I, I really kind of want to speak to you guys. Um, so this is actually for everybody. Uh, did you guys get, get a seed? It, it, uh, at the other church, uh, my wife got two packs of sunflower seeds. One is this one with a husk on it. Yeah. And the other was just the actual seed inside. And people were eating them. I'm like, you're eating my illustration. <laughs> so anyway, so like you guys in the back, you, guys, you got a seed? Yeah, all right, so. I mean, you're looking at the same thing I am. It doesn't look like much, does it? It's just, it's just this unsuspecting seed. And it's hard to imagine by just looking at this, based on what's before our eyes, it's hard to imagine that this could produce this. Go to the next slide. Isn't that something? We actually have a field as you're coming up 31, so like near Elk Rapids somewhere. Acres and acres. Have you ever driven by sunflower like fields? It, they're like stunning. It's like, oh my goodness. So I want to talk to you about the unsuspecting power of a seed. I don't, it really doesn't matter what kind of seed it is. Seeds aren't particularly attractive. They're just seeds. We chew on them and spit them out. If it's the, if it's the seed inside, we so, sunflower seeds are yummy. So I have a very simple message to share with you guys, but with the young people in particular. And there's a reason, as I, as I think about my own story, that I want to share with the young people. But, but laying something out that's simple is not the same as, as it being easy. There's some things that are really simple to understand, like, yeah, I get it. But doing it, it's a whole other deal. So I want to share with you a series of slides. I'm not going to teach uh, deeply on any of them, but there's kind of a thread. And uh, I'm told that people in the Upper Peninsula are, are extraordinarily intelligent. So I'm assuming you're going to be able to catch the thread here. And, uh, and I'm, I'm going to actually make it pretty obvious. So I'm going to, I want to share with you, like, bam, 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 a series of passages and see if you can find out what the common theme is. First one is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. And Jesus is teaching parable. He's trying to help people understand, like, the kingdom of God. You know how Jesus said, pray, when you pray, pray this way, our Father in heaven. The first part of the prayer is that his name would be glorified in the world. And the second thing is, uh, pray that his kingdom would come. And his will would be done on earth the same way God's will is done in heaven. So he's, he's trying to help them understand when he's talking about the kingdom of God and, and the, the kingdom of the heavens coming here, what's he talking about? So he unleashes this series of, 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 of parables. 
So it says in uh, Matthew 13, verses 1 through 3, Later that same day, Jesus left the house and sat beside the lake. A large crowd soon gathered around him, so he got into a boat. Then he sat there and taught as the people stood on the shore. And he told many stories. Uh, he said, like, many stories all making the same point in the form of parables, such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seeds. Okay? I'm going to skip down to Matthew uh, same chapter, uh, ver- uh, Matthew 13, verses 31 and 32. Here is another illustration Jesus used. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Now, if he had said a sunflower seed, I'd be golden on my illustration. But he said a mustard seed, but it, it really doesn't matter. It could be apple seed. It could be any kind of seed. He says, um, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of garden plants. It grows into a tree, and birds come and make nests in its branches. Moving on to Matthew chapter 17, in this case, he's talking, the context, he's talking about faith. It says, afterward, the disciples asked Jesus privately, why couldn't we cast out that demon? It's kind of a strange question that just popped in my head. Have you ever dealt with a demon-possessed person? I didn't learn about this stuff in seminary, Tim, but I have. It was a fascinating story to even hear how this young woman who came to me in full-blown demon possession, how do you end up possessed by a demon? And as she explained her story, I went, oh, I, I totally get it. She was, a, she was a Caucasian girl from the United States, but she was on the mission field with her parents in West, West Africa, which is entirely Muslim. And women in that culture have no, women and children have no protection. And so one of the local African women said, if you, if, you, if you do this sacrifice and make this incantation or whatever, a spirit guide will come and, and, and protect you. And that's what she did. And of course, the Bible says that Satan is a liar. So this demon comes and is basically kind of around her, but not in her, tormenting her, freaking her out. And the demon says, if you invite me in, I will come in and give you powers to protect you. And, and that's what she did. And that, that's actually what led to her possession. So uh, demon possession is far more prevalent in the world than we may realize. I don't, I don't encounter it the same way Jesus and his disciples did all that often. But I suspect we're dealing with the demonic realm way more often than we realize. So Jesus responds. He says, you don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. I tell you the truth, if you had faith even as small as a, here it is again, mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. Now I want to jump into the Gospels. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul, the Apostle Paul here is talking about, so these are different topics. I'm just trying to give you the context. Here he's, he's talking about the resurrection. And in uh, verses 35, Uh, Through 37, he says, But someone may ask, how will the dead be raised? What kind of bodies will they have? What a foolish question. And when I looked at that, I I remember, I I don't know how many times I've said to people, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Ask whatever you want. No dumb questions. Well, apparently Paul would say there are dumb questions because they just asked one. When you put a seed into the ground, it doesn't grow into a plant unless it dies first. And what you put in the ground is not the plant that will grow, but only a bare seed of wheat or whatever you're planting. Earlier in the same chapter, now he's, he's talking about something different. He's talking about people who are, they're, uh, they're, 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 um, it's kind of like, hey, I, you know, I, I follow this team or I follow that team. This is my leader. Yeah, well, that's my leader. And it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's about where your ultimate allegiance should lie. So Paul says, after all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? Really saying, who cares? We are only God's servants through whom you believe the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What is important is that it gets done. Because a seed can't grow. You, you can't get to that huge field of flowers if somebody's not sowing seed, right? But he says at, at the end of the day, it's not important who... who who, who does the planting and who does the watering? What's important is that God makes the seed grow. And I, I'm going to pause just here, here for a moment. This is one of my rabbit trails. I'll, I'll try not to get on too many. I've been thinking about um, the fact that g- God makes it grow. We said, well, he, Paul, first century, he didn't know. He didn't understand, you know, uh, agriculture like we do now. We have natural explanations. You put the, the seed in the ground and you got the nutrients and the water and the sun no, I, I, these people weren't stupid. 
They lived in the natural world probably more than we do. But the more I think about it, the more I'm convinced that the division between the supernatural and the natural world is a false division. Honestly, you guys, I think every time a seed breaks out of its shell, I don't care what the seed is and it comes out of the ground, it's a miracle. How does this happen? It's crazy. You drive by cornfields or in, in Traverse City, ch cherry orchards and, and vineyards everywhere. There's, it, I'm telling you, the natural world, it's supernatural. God is the one. We can plant the seed, we can water it. He's the one who makes it grow. I, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming increasingly convinced this natural world isn't so natural after all. It's, it's supernatural. You take God out of the equation, everything dies. Anyway, goes on to John, uh, John chapter 12. Last verse to kind of make this point. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. So he's right. This is kind of his, his, last, his last kind of series of messages before he dies. And he says, very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And I'll tell you, I... I I struggle with this in my, in my own life. There's a part of me that I understand when I gave my life to Jesus when I was 15 years old. It was a death and resurrection. But that old Nick that died 45 years ago, he has a tendency every once in a while to want to grab hold of that dead carcass and drag it around and make life all about me. And when I make life all about me, you can ask my wife, it's not pretty. When I make it about Jesus because then his love commands me to love my wife. And I'm, I'm telling you, when I gave my life to Jesus when I was 15, it changed everything. I tell people all the time, I, re, I distinctly remember what it's like to be lost. If you guys knew what my life was like at the age of 13 and 14 and 15 when I used to show up for church and sneak out of mass to sit in somebody else's car because nobody locked their cars back then, right? And smoke weed. And then sneak back into church just in time to take Holy Communion. If God was purely a God of wrath, I'd have been toast a long time ago. And I got involved. I was a three-sport athlete, popular kid, got scouted by two professional baseball teams when I was 14 years old. And I was empty and dead on the inside. And then one day, a hellfire and brimstone Southern Baptist kid, no offense to any Southern Baptist, <laughs> but he came over and shared the gospel. And I, I, it was probably the worst gospel presentation in history. I'm telling you, it was horrible. He used every Christian cliche. I had no idea what he was talking about. I had never read the Bible. He's talking about being born again, washed in the blood, walking with God. Walking with God? What are you talking about? And... Uh, but that was the day that, uh, you know, I just said, hey, in the outside chance there actually is a God and you're in the business of changing lives and you can do something with a screw up like me, have at it. And, and, and that was the day that the, the shell of my old life went into the ground and, and, and something, something new came up. I don't know if you guys remember, there's an old, uh, I don't know if the Gaithers wrote it, but an old song that says, all I had to offer him was brokenness and strife. And he made something beautiful out of my life. Now, it ain't that beautiful. I got lots of rough edges. I remember a prayer that an old African-American, or no, just an African woman prayed. It was like, Lord, I know I'm not what I should be, and I know I'm not what I could be. And I know, Lord, I'm not what I one day will be. But I thank you, Lord, that I'm not what I used to be. So that's, that's kind of my story too. But all of these verses that talk about seeds have one thing in common. All of them teach the principle of multiplication. Remember this one seed? And then you saw the slide with a field full of, of, of flowers. You've probably heard the old adage that you can count the number of ap seeds in an apple. I asked at the other church, I said, does anybody actually know how many seeds are in an apple? Is it like six in one and 14 in another? And I think somebody said pretty much five seeds in an apple. 
There might be some variation. But the point is, is if we cut open an apple, you could literally count. Even a watermelon, is assuming it's a, it's a watermelon with seeds, there might be hundreds, but you can count them. But you literally cannot count the number of apples or sunflowers in one seed. That's literally true. So to, to, to illustrate the unsuspecting power of a single seed or a single life, just one life fully surrendered to Jesus. And I, I want to talk to, you, to, to, to the young people because when I was 15 years old and I came to faith, it's like this, like the scales fell off and I went, oh, like, are you serious? I started to read the Bible. I'm reading, I'm reading these stories of this rock star, this like real life superhero named Jesus. And I'm going, what? And I'm grabbing my, my, my homeboys, my, the athletes and the cheerleaders and all my friends and like, sit down. I wasn't like begging them, please let me talk to you. I was like, sit down. And I'm like, have you ever read this? And they're like completely freaked out. Like, what happened to Nick? Like, what? But, but I, I seriously, over about a two, two and a half year period of time, I probably led a hundred kids to Christ. I made every mistake. I was like, a, they should have locked me up for two years to like calm down. But I still haven't calmed down. I st- I st- seriously, I still cannot believe that the God of the universe sent his son into the world to die for somebody like me. But I, I didn't understand the biblical principle of multiplication. And so even though a lot of kids came to faith, I became the bottleneck because I wasn't training anybody else up to do it. So um, I, I, just by way of illustration, I said at the last church, if I asked 100 atheists, let's say there's 100 atheists in this room, and I said, how many of you have ever heard the name Billy Graham? How many hands do you think would go up? I would be surprised if, 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 uh, if there was anybody there that didn't know who Billy Graham was. Everybody knows who Billy Graham was. But if I got 100 deeply committed followers of Jesus, and I said, raise your hand if you've ever heard the name Curtis Sargent. I can tell by your expression you're going, who? Which absolutely makes my point. The estimates are that Billy Graham through his crusades, had 3.2 million decisions. Now, how many of those people who prayed, who walked down and all of that, actually began to follow Jesus? It's probably, well, we, they know it's significantly less. So maybe it was, actually the estimates are of the 3.2 million, it's probably more like 320,000 actually gave their lives to Christ and began to, to walk with Jesus. But that was one of the great laments of Billy Graham's life. At the end of his life, he said, if I had a chance to do it all over again, I would not have done stadium evangelism for, for, the, for the very reason that um, it's pretty easy to get people to raise their hand, pray a prayer. It's a whole other deal to get them to actually follow Jesus. And that, Jesus, Jesus never once led anybody in a sinner's prayer. He said, come follow me. And I'll, I'll show you how to become fishers of men. Not, not the praying a prayer of, I mean, I prayed a prayer and it, it changed my life, but there's, but there's more to it. So there's a, this guy named Curtis Sargent I just mentioned. So here, here's a little story about Curtis Sargent. I met him a few years ago. He trained me at Auburn University in Alabama, on the campus of Auburn University. And uh, I'm kind of chuckling in my spirit because I had a friend of mine with me from Kolkata, India, uh, Pastor Benjamin Francis. And he doesn't know American culture. He's from Kolkata. I said, hey, Ben, when we're walking on Auburn's university, yell, roll tide. <laughs> now, you, if, if you don't appreciate college football, that would make no <laughs> sense. But you don't yell, roll tide on Auburn, <laughs> Auburn's campus. I think I about got Ben killed. But anyway, I'm, I'm with Curtis Sargent. I'm, I, and I'm listening to this guy. And I'm going, dear Jesus, please return right now because I'm going to die listening to this guy. He was, it would be more interesting to watch paint dry. He was... Curtis, when he, he talked, he pretty much talked like this. And I got four days with this guy all day for four. Except when he got really excited. Then he kind of talked like this. It never <laughs> changed. I'm like, oh. Two hours later, I'm repenting because in spite of his terrible delivery, I realized I was standing in the presence of a giant. I saw Curtis in, in April in Indiana. Seymour, Indiana, just south of Indianapolis, said, Curtis, um, do you have any idea? Because he's a data guy. He's, a, he's got five PhDs. He's brilliant. I said, do you have any idea how many people 
didn't just pray a prayer, but they've come to faith in Jesus and they're following Jesus and discipling others to do the same. Do you have any idea? And he's very sheepish because he's so quiet, so introverted and so humble. He said, well, it's interesting that you ask that because I, I actually do know that there are six people. Now he's discipled way more than that. But just from those six, he knows uh, for sure that there are 50 million people who are following Jesus and teaching others. And I said, excuse me? Was that five zero? He said, yeah. I said, was that a million? He said, yeah. The real number, uh, well, I can't tell you what the real number is. I don't know for sure, but I would venture to say the number of people who are following Jesus and training others to do the same in the world today through Curtis's lineage is probably closer to two to 300 million. This is the unsuspecting power of a seed. Now, to be clear, the Bible makes it clear that we're actually not the seed. The Bible teaches us that the seed is actually God's word. And so what does, the, what does the Bible teach about itself? What does the word of God teach us about the word of God? Because the, because the word is the seed. Well, again, just very quickly, three verses. I'm just going to read through them. Isaiah 55 from the Old Testament says, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Hebrews 4 in the New Testament, verse 12, it says, for the word of God is alive, it's powerful. I think we forget that. We, we become so familiar with the things of God, we forget that God's word is It's alive. It's living. And I tell people all the time, words create worlds. When you say, you know, you guys live in a world where people get bullied all the time. And when I was a kid, people used to say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Right? That's a lie from the pit of hell. Words hurt. Words tear down Words build up. God created the universe through his word. And it says God's word, it's alive. It's active. Um, it is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. The last verse, as it relates to God's word, is Romans 1.16. I memorized this as a, as a 15-year-old kid. Rocked my world when Paul said, I am not ashamed. I'm telling you right here, right now, I could be out in the middle of the 906 festival. I don't care where I'm at. I'll tell people, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Not only am I not ashamed of the gospel, I am thrilled with the gospel. It saved me. It's the power of God and the salvation for all who believe. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. It doesn't matter what your past is or your present. It's available for everybody. I'm not ashamed. Are you kidding me? I'm supposed to be ashamed? I'm supposed to cower around as a follower of Jesus? My Pakistani brothers, I'm involved in a global ministry called Big Life. My Pakistani brothers, their attitude is, and by the way, they're, they're talking to Muslims who are trying to kill them. I mean, I've met guys that had their heads split open with an axe by, I'm, there's one of our guys is, it was an Al-Qaeda trainer. He came to faith in Jesus after three consecutive nights of dreams of seeing Jesus in dreams. The third night, he fell out of bed reaching for Jesus. I'm telling you guys, when I get these stories from my big life guys around the world, I swear I'm like Tom Cruise and Mission Impossible. The stories are coming in like, you got to be kidding me. So uh, my friends in, 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 in those parts of the world, they say, you guys in the West, you walk around like, oh, please let me talk to you about Jesus. I mean, I, I try not to offend you. They're like, no, no, no. You should be begging me to tell you about Jesus. Are you kidding me? It's the greatest love story in the world. If you don't want to hear it, but that, that's on you. Now, I'm not saying we should be bombastic and, and all of that, but, there, but there's a spirit like, oh, yeah. This is what I, what I mean about Hebrews 4, where it says the word of God is alive and active. Well, that, when I read that, I go, that's right. It, and it, somehow it becomes alive and active in me. And then I go to Romans 1, I go, that's right, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. No way. And neither should you. Now, we shouldn't be proud or arrogant, but we should not be ashamed of the gospel. So what I want to make clear here is that, we, that, that the Bible, God's word is the seed, but we are the sowers of the seed. And friends, he, he, this is where this becomes personal. 
If we want to see lives transformed by Jesus, if we want to see, I lost my seed, it disappeared. If we want to see a seed become this beautiful field of sunflowers, we got to sow the seed. We got to get it out there. Jesus told a parable about a, a person who sowed a lot of seed. It wasn't intended to be a math equation, but if you remember the story, in the first field, what happened? Birds stole it, never even got into the ground. Second field, it gets in and it sprouts up, it looks good, but because the, 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 the soil is shallow and stony, it withers when, they, when, they, when, it, when it's exposed to the heat. The third field, you know, it, it takes off, but there's weeds that choke it out. It's only the fourth field where, where it produces 30, 60, or 100 fold. I think that's pretty true. If I go out and share the gospel with four people that don't know Jesus, chances are probably one out of four. But man, oh man, that one who dies to an old life and something new comes and they have a sphere of influence that I don't have. You guys, gals, all the, the young people, you, your peeps are, are, are really the people you go to school with or work with or whatever. And the vast majority of people 30 and under in our country have never heard the gospel not one time. And they've certainly never had a peer sit down and say, man, can I tell you about the difference Jesus made in my life? And there's a way to do that that's not weird. And it's not standing on street corners telling people they're going to hell. Have you ever found that to be effective? I, I haven't. But. So, the, so, so, so it, it's this principle of the unsuspecting power of a seed. God's word is the seed. We are sowers of the seed. But the problem is most of us have no practical idea how to do it. That's the kicker. Like in my case, so I'm this Irish Catholic boy raised in the church, walked away from the whole deal, get radically saved. Then I get on this track to become a professional Christian. And I get my bachelor's degree in religious studies. Later, I got a master's of divinity. After that, I got a doctor of ministry. So I've got all the credentials, right? Big stinking deal. Nobody discipled me. Is that crazy? I'd gone through all that training. Nobody discipled me how to be a disciple maker. I had no idea of how this principle of kingdom multiplication actually worked. And here's the thing. It's way simpler way simpler than you realize. We just trained five middle schoolers and high schoolers in Traverse City, August 1st and 2nd last week. I was hoping for 500, but I'll take five. Because here's the thing, it doesn't take many. If a few people catch this and begin to do it, you start to see multiplication. And um, I'm super excited because I got them before band camp. I got them before football practices. And, and, but, but now they're going to be going back into school in the fall as disciples with the tools to disciple others who can disciple others and so forth. So, um, you know, in my training, I was taught to do a lot of things, how to preach, how to recruit volunteers, how to do this or that and the other thing, but I was never really discipled. And so I just want to, I'm going to plant a seed, if you will. I'm not going to go through the training. I don't have time. Um, but I went to, um, I, I was exposed to this, this ministry called Big Life right in the thick of leading what was the largest church in northern Michigan at the time. So we started out really as a house church. Just, what was it, Rose? Eight couples? And the whole point was to try to get more people and more people and more people so we could build a big campus and have a lot of staff and a big budget and big programs and big headaches and big, did I just say that? And then I was exposed to this movement, this simple, nothing fancy movement. And I went to India. And again, this is for the young people. I met a guy in India, no, actually in Nepal. He's 18 years old. He, he looked like he was 12. I'm not kidding. He's the youngest 18-year-old I've ever seen. How old are you guys back there? 16? 18? 14? 14? And six, you're right in the wheelhouse. This guy, he's 18 years old. 
So I, I don't know, I was 50-something, I'm 50, I'm, 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 re I'm getting ready to exit the 50s. My, my 60th birthday is August 23rd, so that's freaking me out. <laughs> but I'm talking to this 18-year-old, he had planted 35 churches. I'm just like, what? Met a guy who's 26 years old. He had 600 churches. You know how it happened? They trained a few, who trained a few, who trained a few. It's like, seems like I've heard that somewhere before. That sounds a little bit like hmm, Jesus. Jesus actually tra trained 12. Lost one of them. He knew it would, but I'm not Jesus. So I'm like, what if I recalibrated the whole way I do ministry? What if I could find six people either that had a hunger for multiplication because all of you guys, you get like, like let's just say that it's all on Pastor Tim and guys like me, the hired gun trained professionals. We have no clout with your classmates and friends. Zero. We have no re relational history with them, but you guys do. And so if you want to see that seed turn into a beautiful field of sunflowers or a vineyard or whatever metaphor you want to use, we have got to get serious about training people in these very simple disciple multiplying activities. In the Big Life training, we train people in what we call the, 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 uh, the why. It's kind of the biblical theological foundation. Real simple stuff I won't go into. Then we train them in the who. Like who, so okay, who am I supposed to reach? How about you start with your family, your friends, your classmates, the gal who does your hair, the banker, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. How about the people that are already in your sphere of influence? People you already know and love, and they love you too. What if you started there? And what if you were able to, to share your story, because this, this is the how. We teach people how to share their story, their personal testimony, in three minutes or less. How to share the gospel that clears all the clutter away. Simple. Simple, so simple that people look at it and go, that's, that, I thought it was all this other stuff. I thought I had to jump through this hoop and do spiritual push-ups and blah, blah, blah. And it's, no, it's, 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 this is the gospel. This is the beautiful love story of God rescuing a world spiraling out of control. And they're like, that's it? Like all I have to do is turn away from my sin and receive the gift of God's pardon through Jesus and begin to walk with him and he's going to give me meaning and purpose in this life in heaven when I die. Yeah, it's like if people get that, like you'd be crazy to turn that down. But they don't know. I'm telling you, they don't know because nobody's told them, at least not in language they can understand. So we give it, we give it to people super simple. And then we train people on how to create groups that meet in homes or coffee shops or wherever, that has multiplication baked right into it. In Big Life, I wish I could have time to tell you the Big Life story. This fascinating story about a businessman from Naples, Florida. No ministry background. He thought he had the perfect life. And then he read a book. And he realized he didn't have the perfect life. He had the perfect, my life is really all about me with a little Jesus sprinkled on top. And that took him on a spiritual journey. Lots of trials and errors. He made a ton of mistakes because he was the Western missionary thinking he was the guy to reach people in Iran and India and Bangladesh. And he discovered largely through Luke chapter 10 where Jesus had a larger group of 72 disciples. You guys realize that? We don't know much about them. We don't know anything about them. But they must have orbed around the life of Jesus. And he sent them out on this advanced mission. Sent them out in groups of two into these villages. And they didn't do mass evangelism. They just went in search of, this is a very Middle Eastern concept, the man of peace. Read Luke 10, it's there. The man of peace. And if that a person of peace is somebody that's drawn to you, they know you're an outsider, but they're like drawn to you for some reason. They're the person that's going to offer you hospitality. They didn't have holiday inns back then. So when you were, tra as, a, as a Jew traveling through Israel, there had to be, if there wasn't a person of peace in that village, you shook the dust off your feet and you moved on to another village in search of a person of peace. So Jesus says, look for the person of peace. And if their peace, if they open their home, if they provide hospitality, stay with them. And so the whole strategy is, what if we could reach that one person? What if we could disciple that person to reach their village? Because they know 
They know the people. They know where the bodies are buried. They know, they know everything. And that was the game changer. And so in 2003, we had four tiny little fellowships. Today, we don't even know. Somewhere it's between 25, it's probably actually, actually closer to 50,000 50, groups scattered in over 121 countries on the world. I'm telling you, it is the unsuspecting power of a seed that dies to self, understands the basic principles of multiplication, and watch the kingdom grow. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like yeast. Anything particularly flashy about yeast? I don't even know what yeast looks like, because my wife is the, my wife is an amazing cook. I just, this isn't like the old traditional, I'm the husband, you're the wife, you do the, no, 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 no. It's just, she's, she, is, she is a whiz. She loves to, to cook and to bake, and, and I love the fact that she loves that. I love to eat. The reason I think it's worked is because I've never made her feel like that's your job. Every time she serves me, well, I, would, I don't want to overstate this, but I think she knows deep down how much I really, truly appreciate how she has served me over the years, and hopefully there's, there's ways that I've served her too. I have no idea what, where I was going with that. So uh, I think it's time. I think it's, I think it's time. What's that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeast. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, he says the kingdom of God is like yeast. And it just, little by little, it penetrates and then it transforms. So you guys, especially you, you, you high school students back there, if I knew at your age what I know now, I really do wonder how many people would have come to faith. And I, I praise God that, I remember the days my, my junior year in high school, they kicked us out of the library because there were 90 to 100 students meeting for prayer before school every single day. And, and it was largely because of my testimony. And I don't say that to, to pat myself on the back. I say that in some ways because I'm embarrassed. Had I known, had I, had, had I taken a few and, and taught them how to share their story, actually nobody taught me. I just, I was dumb enough to go out and do it. I couldn't, you couldn't shut me up. You still can't, but any, <laughs> Uh, but I thought, wow, the, the, the kingdom, if we want to see real true kingdom movement, we have to understand the unsuspecting power of a seed and what can happen, young or older, if we learn to put these things into practice and all of a sudden watch the light bulbs go on in people's life. I talked to a guy recently, very successful business guy in Traverse City, Michigan, he has been sleeping in a foxhole his whole life. What I mean by that is I've, I've never been to war, but when you're in war and you're in a war zone and you're sleeping in a foxhole, you don't sleep very well. You sleep with kind of one eye open. This guy was a victim of tremendous uh, domestic violence as a child. His father would drag his mother into his bedroom and put her face right in front of him as he choked her and beat her. And the trauma of that, his, his, this guy has serious sleep issues. And so he ends up in my office and I, I asked him, I said, could you, what, how would you describe in one word your relationship, your spiritual life? And without hesitation, he said, empty. And because after all of my degrees and all the other stuff that doesn't add up to a hill of beans, I received this simple training. I knew exactly how to share my story. And I said, dude, let me tell you about a time in my life when I was empty and dry to the core. And he looked at me like, really? And I told my story about being empty and how Jesus filled it. And I said, uh, if you've got a few more minutes, can I explain to you what a relationship with God really looks like, how, how, how to get started? And I just drew these three circles on a piece of paper with a, I mean, I'm talking simple. And... Uh, the guy began his relationship with Jesus right there. But, but that's, that's not because of all my education. Anybody can do that. And so I'm actually praying these days that the Lord will raise up uh, some high school, middle school and high school students scattered around Michigan that we can train. And they'll reach their friends, reach and disciple their own friends. It's not, that, it's not that people are my age or some skin in the game, but as I think historically, almost every major move of God has been led by young people. So um, that's all I got. Um, 
uh, I spend 95% of my time now with this disciple-making ministry called Big Life. We do not have a Big Life movement. Actually, we just launched in the U.S. in 2016 because we're seeing this sweep Africa. We're seeing it sweep the Middle East. We are so deep inside of ISIS and Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, you'd be shocked. I've got to be careful I don't say too much. Seriously, I, I, we, you know, because everybody knows that there are terrorists who have embedded themselves in this country. We are so deep among the people trying to kill us, you'd, you'd be, it's, it's unbelievable. I'm telling you that it's, and it's the kingdom of God is moving like yeast and it's not moving on the shoulders of the professionals like me. It's moving because of 18-year-old kids in Nepal and former Al-Qaeda trainers in, in, uh, in places like Pakistan. So, um, uh, if there's a, a way that um, this has inspired you at all, um, I would be happy to come back someday and sit down and kind of show you how this all works. I'm telling you, it is simple, simple, simple stuff. But whether I come back or whatever, I just, I just hope you guys understand it's not on, all on Pastor Tim. It's partly on you, dude. Yeah. By the way, he's, he's playing guitar and he's got that bait. I'm like, you're rocking it out, man. Way to go. Anyway, that's it. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you, let you wrap this up however you want. Thank you so much for letting me come and share with you guys, and go blue.